So hi, and welcome to Poetry Passages. I'm Clifford Rames, and welcome back to the third installment of our curated series of interviews and verse in partnership with the literary estate of David Budville as we celebrate the life and poetry of David Budville. David was a poet and a playwright from the mountains of Vermont. Where he for over 40 years, where he lived for over 40 years. And David died in 2016, but his legacy and influence on both budding and established poets lives on. To talk about what ba David Budville meant to him and to read a couple of poems, including an elegy he wrote for David, is my special guest, Howard Nelson. Hi, Howard. How's it going? Good, good, <laughs> good, good. good. Glad, to, um, glad to be here. Good to have you. Thanks so much for coming. Um, Howard is the author of several books of poetry, including his most recent collection, That Was Really Something. Howard has also edited a number of books, most notably My Likeness, Nature Poetry of Walt Whitman, and Robert Bly, An Introduction to the Poetry. Howard lives in the Finger Lakes region of New York and is a professor emeritus at Cayuga Community College. So thanks again, Howard, for coming on the program. And I understand that you would like to start us off with a poem. Right. Well, I'm, I'm so glad you're doing this. It's, it's hard for a poet to, to be remembered. Um, and uh, David's daughter, Nadine, is doing her, her best to mm. sponsor events and uh, make connections. And you're doing this is, is, is it's it's great um thank you and um so david budville i think he's um best known now for these books from copper canyon mm -hmm. four of them um moment to moment and uh, and then three more finally tumbling toward the end his his last poems his farewell poems but um before those books, there was this book, Jude Divine. Um, and uh, before that book, there was this book, The Chainsaw Dance, which was his first, uh, I, I think he actually had a little book that he didn't like before that. <laughs> but, um, but this was the book that got him really started and um, a friend of mine somewhere around 72 or 73 gave me uh, a copy of this book in a pile of poetry books. And this one came out, arrived like a revelation. It was something that I just uh, was waiting for or ready for. I, I, I loved it. And so um, I would like to read the first poem from the first book, which is Hermie. And I, I imagine this is the first poem of his that I ever read because I you know, opened the book and there it is. It is yeah. And um, so it's kind of an, uh, an overture to all his poetry for me and also for our friendship that uh, developed after that. Cool. So Hermie, we're up in Vermont here. Hermie Newcomb lived in a bread truck on the edge of Bear Swamp. The bread truck is still there with a spruce tree through the roof and the remains of his last pig pen. He had a bunk up front where the seats used to be. So in the morning, he could wake up and look out the windshield at the day. There was a little wood stove in the back. Hermie brought the stove wood in through the rear doors so he wouldn't have to lug it through this, his bedroom. There was a table and a chair and some crates for cupboards. It was always neat in there. It was a good place and cozy. Hermie didn't need anything as big as a bus. His woman, Florence, was an Indian from New York. Before he lived in the bread truck, they had a shack next to the Dunhill Cemetery. And before that, they lived on Hermes family place on the Aiken Pond Road up from the schoolhouse where I used to live. But one night, 
while they were still at the home place, Hermie got pissed at something, nobody knows what, and flew into a rage, which he did about twice a week. But this time went too far and lit both house and barn and watched them burn. When the neighbors came, Hermie was out in the snow in the dooryard, stomping and screaming, burn, goddammit, burn, you worthless place. You never was no goddamn good. Nobody could ever be quite sure when Hermie was drunk. He acted crazy all the time. There's nothing left of the Newcomb place now, only the spring box. Those tamarack boards will last forever. Then they moved over to the shack by the cemetery. Hermie liked it there, said it was the first place he ever lived where he had decent neighbors. Antoine tells about going past there on a Saturday night and seeing Hermie and Florence dancing with the chainsaw going in the middle of the floor. Hermie and Florence would get drunk. Then Hermie would adjust the carburetor on the saw so it would run too rich, so it would sputter and bounce with a rhythm worthy of a good musician. Then they'd sing and dance to the music of the saw. Hermie could cut pulp like a son of a bitch. He could pull and jam when he wanted to, but that wasn't very often. Everybody said he was worthless. Hiram still says his mother should have knocked him in the head when he was born and spent the money on some grain to, to raise a pig. Hermie never did anybody any harm. In fact, the night he burnt the home place, he was sure to get Florence and the cats out before he struck the match. He burnt the cemetery place too. That's when Florence left him, went back to the reservation or to Morrisville, I don't know where. Then he moved alone into the bread trunk, bread truck in the swamp. Hermie spent his life looking for the perfect place. That's what all those fires were about. And in the end, he found that place. The bread truck wouldn't burn. Wonderful. So we know I just, I just uh, thought I, I had never read anything quite like that. And it was what I was looking for. And you said that was probably like the first David Butler Pill poem that you had come across. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. And even how long ago would you say that was? Well, it was 70 two or three or uh, right in there, maybe four. So here's here's the story. I, oh. I taught 50 years at that college that you mentioned, Huber Community College. Mm -hmm. I was a young, um, a rookie in the English department. And uh, they turned to me uh, and said, I want anybody want to run a visiting writers program? As the others didn't. And so I said, oh yeah, okay. And I did that, and it was one of the great things about my my work and career there. I got to choose the visiting writers um, and meet a lot of very interesting people. And after I read the Chainsaw Dance, I got in touch with him right away, and and uh, he came over from Vermont, and that was when we got to know each other. And uh, I remember quite clearly three. The, I had him three times over the years. The first time. Uh, I remember him reading that poem and Antoine, if, if you know his, his work of this period, the, uh, Antoine's a big character and he could do these characters wonderfully when he read aloud, the dialect um, and uh, expressiveness. So that was a big hit. People loved hearing his poetry. And then he kept writing these poems. And a few years later, he came again, I invited him again and he was still writing them. And he read from a book called Why I Came to Judevine. And that includes some amazing poems that um, uh, people who, who read them, I, I think often uh, love them. And one, one bunch was a, a character named Tommy Stames, a Vietnam vet who comes back and is, is wounded psychologically wounded and uh, he has a romance um, with 
a woman named Grace. And David tells the story of that those people so well. I went back this afternoon thinking about this tonight and, and read the, those poems for the first time. And they brought tears to my eyes yeah. again. And I know that the people at the community college had the same reaction. So that so, was, must have been what, the late 70s, early 80s when he came? That was that probably into the 80s the second time. Mm -hmm. And then the third time he came, he he was, uh, he had, at first, he, Drew Divine Mountain was a character mm. that he was going to, you know, would appear among these other characters. But pretty soon, Drew Divine Mountain, the, the mask fell and it was, David himself, and then he wrote all those poems without calling himself officially Jew Divine Mountain. It was, they were more personal. Yeah, yeah. I'm speaking, not him. Right. Jew Divine Mountain is a, is, a, is a takeoff on Cold Mountain, Han Shan's name for himself. Mm. So um, anybody who's curious, this book was published in 1976. Um, it's making it one of, I think, David's second book. And it's so wonderful just as, as I listen to you speak to hear, you know, and, you know I often think about David Bill's legacy and what's, what was his impact on poetry, but there it is. I mean, 1970, mid 70s, and we're still talking about this poem and yeah. his impression is, is lasting on you. And as you were talking, and I wanted to, uh, I had some thoughts I had scribbled down earlier um, about David's poems and, and that they sort of range in style from as this poem is that early epic storytelling of these characters of, of Judavine and two wonderful observations on life, art, uh, nature, and the world. And then on to in his mid career, he went into sort of um, um, or his later career, actually, meditations on mortality and death. Um, and buried in all those layers is this sort of deep, deep seated empathy for the planet and all of its creatures, an unwavering hope and goodness and a wide reaching soul touching wisdom that could only have been carved out over the years by pain, anger, and disappointment. Um, and through all that, he has this uncanny ability to say something deeply profound, but very simply. Um, do you agree with all that? And, and I mean, if you had to describe what David was trying to tell the world through his body of work, um, what would that be? Mm. Um, yeah, I was, when, when you sent me the, the notes for this and, and that statement, I thought, boy, that is a very a excellent, uh, accurate statement summary of him. Mm. And um, I agree with, with all of it, but especially the ending of it, which is a wide reaching soul touching wisdom that could only have been carved out over the years by pain, anger, and disappointment. Yeah. And there, you know, he, he kept in, he had that in his life and he kept yeah. in touch with it. And uh, then, uh, and he had this uncanny ability to say something deeply profound, simply, mm -hmm. well, hit the nail on the head. That's, that's a great, true sentence about David Budbell. Yeah. I wanted to say, um, you asked, uh, how would you describe him as a person? And um, that, do you want me to answer that now? Yeah, absolutely. You, now? you started yeah. to go there, and then we kind of got distracted a little bit. Yeah. Well, um, it was a it was interesting to have that question asked to me. Um, I I knew him for thirty five years, and we lived seven uh, seven hours apart. Um, I would go to Vermont. Oh, I got to say, when I first the first visit to Vermont, and you go there. And there's David, very friendly, but going around and says, there's where Hermes <laughs> truck was. Uh, you know, like that down that road. And so that was like, oh, there's the schoolhouse that we lived in. The things. So it really was. These places uh, were real, yeah. Pretty, a pretty autobiographical. He got in some trouble, in fact, writing about his neighbors uh, so vividly. <laughs> I've heard this. Not yeah. everybody <laughs> liked it. But um as it's describe him as a person, first thing that came to me is funny. Funny. He's a very funny guy. I think I laughed more in his company than Aww. anybody else I know. You know? <laughs> and uh, uh, so that's a good quality. And a lot of that comes also, true I would say, in, those, in the poems in Judavine and you know, yeah. sort of a, a quirky, you know, not only was he 
observing the quirkiness, but he was being quirky himself. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I think that the, the humor c continues all the way through as he changes to a more autobiographical, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm the personas uh, kind of poetry. He, he, never, he never stopped being funny. I mean, even in, poem, even in tumbling toward the end <laughs> yeah yeah i mean even this poem hermy i mean that you just read i mean there's there's yeah. just an array of comic scenes in there you know them dancing around the chain <laughs> the, the chainsaw which is bouncing around on the middle of the floor <laughs> right um, i think so i've actually been to bear swamp yeah and i but i didn't see the i didn't see the bread truck though <laughs> <laughs> i wonder if it's still there. oh the bread truck wasn't there but he said it's that's no, where it no was. longer there yeah <laughs> <laughs> I think we so, all want. Um, we, I think we all want our own bread trucks to live in. <laughs> right, right. And I would also say that he was practical. He was he he was a a good woodcutter and gardener. I mean, that's not just a pose. He he did all that work, and he was very good at it. He was always. I I I do both of those things on a on a, a different scale. Um, he was always a better homesteader than I was. Uh, and I would say he was, he's realistic. That part about the being carved over the years by pain, anger, and disappointment. He, um, he was a little scornful of what he would call hippy dippy thinking. Um, and of course he's living in Vermont all those years when there's a lot of idealism and failed experiments going on around him. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but he always knew that, uh, all you need is love wouldn't cut it. He, uh, he had a hard-nosed quality. And um, so uh, that kind of two-sidedness, dualistic contradictoriness is, uh, is true of him. He's, he's, it's my kind of spiritual. Uh, he, 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 um, he never loses sight of the sorrow. Uh, that's involved in living. You asked um, another big question that, uh, what if, I, if you had to describe what David was trying to tell the world through his body of work, what would that be? So uh, I thought, I've thought about that all afternoon. Um, hard question, but what I come up with is a line from a poem of his, what Isa said, since there will, oh, there will always we will always have a suffering world. We will always need a song. Right. That that kind of two sidedness. And, and it's probably also, by no by no accident that that's the that's what's written on his memorial stone. That's right. That's memorial. right. It is written on his stone. Yeah. Um, and then I would also say uh, his awareness from the beginning that this that life is not going to last. Mm -hmm. He was a serious Buddhist. Uh, you know, not, I don't know, he wasn't in a, um, in any sangam, but uh, he meditated every day and he certainly read a lot of Buddhist texts. Um, and so awareness of the, the transitory nature of life was always mm -hmm. in there. And uh, I guess I wrote it down this way. Um, this life is is not going to last, so we'd better try to enjoy it and appreciate it in all its painfulness and sensory beauty, pleasure, and it wouldn't be too much to say glory, because David did have a sense of the, the glory of the ordinary. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Well, um, something you said about you know, how it's not an experiment, and I, I'm this is something I talked about a little bit in our last, with our last guest, Jody Gladding, and um, how, you know, David's time in, in Vermont in the mountains wasn't, a, wasn't like a, an experiment in living like a la Thoreau. It was, you know, it was who he was, and he wasn't this hippie fellow living in the woods, you know, even though he, you know, to, to the uneducated outside observer, he may, you may think he is, but he was far mm -hmm. from that. Um, mm -hmm. even though he was a farmer and a woodcutter and a poet and you know, he had a very sort of I don't know uh, kind of cutting edge to his his uh poetic softness as well yeah I guess mm -hmm. a good way to put it um well you um you wrote a poem when David died correct 
Um, and it's yeah. an el elegy to David. Right. Uh, when you want to talk to us about well, that. And... I would, um, yeah, I wanted to read this when you proposed this idea. Um, yeah. It's a, it'll take me a, a few minutes to read it, but um, so when David, David had a serious disease. I, this is kind of self-explanatory. I don't need to say much. It's, mm. it's all in the poem. And um, uh, but when he when he was dying, Lois, who also had, became a very close friend of of mine, um, she called, and um, and this this tells about that. So oh, I'll just go ahead and read it. And if there's anything, we, we can talk about it after. Sure, absolutely, please. Okay. <laughs> Elegy for David Budbill. I am sitting in my friends David and Lois's condominium, which they moved to when it became clear that their days on the homestead were numbered. Homestead they bought 50 years ago, 100 acres in the Northeast Kingdom. Back then, a condominium was the last thing they were looking for. Not sure if there was such a thing as condominiums back then. I think they were just starting to come in. They built a house that was a model of modesty and efficiency of homesteader simplicity and style. It had just the right amount of well-chosen amenities, mudroom with bench to sit on while removing boots, attached woodshed so you could get logs to fill up the wood box without going out into the snow, firewood all cut and stacked by David himself, freezer across from the bench for all the vegetables from the garden. A study for him upstairs, painting studio downstairs for her. A study, <clears throat> large old upright wood stove in the living room, which was also the dining room, also the kitchen, no walls between them, just different areas of the same living space. It seemed open, it seemed orderly with the right amount of furniture, all of it old. But the refrigerator was new. The kitchen stove was modern, not cast iron. Frugality, not poverty. There was nothing run down about the place. Guest room upstairs with a view out the window of miles of forested mountains rolling in the distance. They'd talked about moving to town for a while in a hypothetical way. But finally, hypothetical, this is the hard thing to grasp, turns into reality. Cutting firewood, keeping a large garden, filling the freezer, pickling, shoveling snow and so on and so on. At some point, no longer possible. You just can't manage any longer. And so even though you hate to do it, eventually you have to sell the homestead trade it for a condominium down in Montpelier. Two years later, he's lost the battle with a rare, terrible disease, progressive supranuclear palsy. If lost is the right word, if battle is the right word for the inevitable. I remember a visit when it was in the earlier stages David and I went for a walk on the loop trail in the woods behind the house. He was walking with a stick slowly. And at one point he lost his balance and keeled over, crashing into the brush. It was such a shock. I helped him up, lifted him onto his feet again. It was a struggle. He was heavy and clumsy now. He was my friend who lived seven hours away. 35 years, hundreds of letters back and forth between us. In the last year, when he couldn't write any longer, I wrote in a card 
man, I sure miss your letters, which kept me interested and laughing for such a long time. I'm grateful to Lois for calling to tell me when it was clear it would soon be time for him to go. If you want to see David again, you'd better come now. So I drove the seven hours. I was lucky to get there in time to see him while he was still breathing. He wasn't conscious. His body was trying hard to keep breathing as it was accustomed to doing. When Lois and Nadine took a break from watching, I sat with him alone for an hour or so. I talked to him. I read him some poems, his own and some others, mostly his own. I picked some of my favorites. Most were about the homestead, the place he described so well in hundreds of glimpses, about standing by the wood stove, warming up with wood stove satisfaction, about shooting the groundhog in the garden, about making red sauce, drinking wine. He loved to write about such things, about the place where he called himself a recluse. Well, he was partly a recluse but actually more of a hedonist of silence and work, a recluse who loved to take trips to New York City, a recluse who was married to one woman for 50 years, who had many friends and scribbled madly in an effort to communicate all the while. I read him a few of his philosophical complaints including Bugs in a Bowl, maybe the poem he was most famous for, if famous is the right word for it. Bugs in a Bowl. Han Shan, that great and crazy, wonder-filled Chinese poet of a thousand years ago said, we're just like bugs in a bowl, all day going around, never leaving their bowl. I say, that's right. Every day, climbing up the steep side, sliding back over and over again, around and around, up and back down. Sit in the bottom of the bowl, head in your hands, cry, moan, feel sorry for yourself. Or look around, see your fellow bugs, walk around, say, hey, how are you doing? Say, nice bowl. I read him this one, Dilemma. I want to be famous so I can be humble about being famous. What good is my humility when I am stuck in this obscurity? I told him once that being fairly famous in Vermont was famous enough. He agreed, sort of. I read him one by his old friend Hayden Carruth about jazz trombone players. They both love jazz. They used to listen to it together and talk about it for hours. I read him one by Robert Frost, who people sometimes said he resembled poems about New England, about people, tough competition, better not to compare, but you'd have to give David the edge in at least one thing. He was a lot funnier than Robert Frost, and humor is one of the great virtues in poetry, not to mention one of the things that gets us through life. It was a strange poetry reading, him lying there unresponsive, they say hearing is the last sense to go. Then Lois came in and said dinner was ready. David could not join us at the table where he would have been in the days when I visited them many times at the beautiful homestead in the mountains. Where has that energy gone that was him? It's in the wine cups of his poems and the clay jugs of his plays. About nine, 
I went to the bed and breakfast where I was staying. In the morning, Nadine called and said he died a little after midnight. I had breakfast, sitting with the other guests, strangers. I went back. A few friends were filtering in. Japanese flute music playing. Several of his books were laid out on the table. Very little talking. The idea was to have a quiet vigil. He was still in the bedroom, still in the hospital bed, but not in the hospital gown. Now he was wearing a bright embroidered shirt and an embroidered Middle Eastern hat. He liked to dress like that for special occasions. From the chair in the living room, a far view of the mountains, huge banks of September clouds floating above them. Same view from the condominium as from the homestead. Hundreds of letters between us. Who will write me so many letters now? Wow, it's amazing. Thank you, Howard, that was beautiful. I have this, this line, where has that energy gone? That was him, it's in the wine cups of his poems and the clay jugs of his plays. And that's so true. I mean, he lives on and, you know, and I've said this before, you know, you, when you read David Budville, you feel like you, you're, you're just, he's letting you into his life. And, and that mm -hmm. continues even today after right. even five years gone now. But, well, is this poem going to be um, published at any point? Or? Well, I have a new book, presumably, hopefully coming yeah. out sometime in, in, in 2023, I think. And yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll be, be in there. It'll be in there. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I wanted to say that, so the, my last book was, this one called That Was Really Something. And then the new one is going to be called Something As Simple As That. It's sort of like a, you know, <laughs> son of. Yes, uh, son. And uh, as I'm putting it together, I realized that uh, the poems that are in it are kind of autobiographical, but there's a lot of them about other people in their ordinary half broken lives. And they're written in a sort of a casual, free flowing mm. narrative style. Right. And I realized, guess what? I'm trying to write the poems that David wrote 40 years ago, oh. 50 years ago. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's a, a wonderful tribute right there. I mean, but <sighs> look forward to the book. I'm, I'm, your poem left me speechless. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anything else? Any closing I, re comments, remarks, I, observations about David? Howard? No, I, I, I guess that's good to, place to stop. So yeah. thank you very much for thank putting you. this on and inviting me. And you're, thank you for, for sharing that, that heart-wrenching but beautiful poem. Um, and thanks to everybody for watching. Um, thanks once again to Howard um, for coming on the program and watch for his new, new book in 2023. And till then, we'll see you again real soon right here on Poetry Passages. Bye. Bye, Howard.